All right, we're recording. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Peter Smallage. I'm the New York State Extension Forester. Today is January 15th. Happy New Decade 2020. It's uh, my pleasure to host the Forest Connect webinar series because we always have great presenters such as we have uh, such as we have today. We have uh, Dr. Jeff Ward, who's going to be talking about deer invasives, residual density, and forest regeneration. Jeff and I go way, way, way back. I was a field grunt for Jeff when he was a PhD student at Purdue. We had a, had a fun relationship for the last several decades, and uh, Jeff's been a presenter on the Forest Connect webinar series before. He does a great job, has great science that he shares in a way that makes it very digestible and useful for our, everybody working in the woods. So with that, Jeff, I'm going to mute my microphone and it's all you. Thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks, uh, Pete, for the invitation. I thank everyone uh, who's on the, uh, the webinar. Do my best job here to do some information on overload you. I will remind you, uh, when I go through some of the graphs later on, Pete is recording this so you can go back through the graphs, or you can send me an email and I'll send you a, uh, a PDF so you can take a look at it at your leisure. So we have a lot of ground to cover, hopefully not too much. What we're gonna, first of all, is, is talk about uh, some wor work we did looking at uh, the impact of deer and invasives on forest regeneration. Uh, then I'm going to cover uh, a study we did on uh, hunting, areas where hunted not hunting, uh, over different residual stands where they were actually trying to regenerate the stands and see uh, what impact that had on regeneration. And I think I'll have enough time to talk a little bit about deer and stump sprouting. And I, that was actually a real eye-opener for us. So one of the things we always need to do is we need to thank uh, all of our uh, collaborators, our cooperators, and our funding sources. And we've been really blessed in this study to have people all over the board from local state agency to, I saw regional water authority, uh, Alex is out there. So there are people from NRCS, the Forest Service, uh, Nature Conservancy, and a lot of local land trusts. Actually, Providence Water too has been a great help. And I want to thank the people who've uh, all worked on this project. Uh, Megan Lenski is a uh, postdoc, uh, has been working with us. Scott Williams uh, looks like me, but he's uh, six foot eight, and uh, he does uh, most of the tick work. Tom Worthley at UConn was involved in a lot of the invasive stuff. Uh, Pete gave us a lot of advice when we started out on this, and certainly can't forget our uh, technicians, JP Barsky and Mike Short. Without them, we would never get the work done. So I'm going to give you a couple of take-home slides, and then if you want to answer your emails while you're listening, go ahead. But Ralph Nyland, uh, especially I think those in New York or anybody who went to SUNY ESF knows, is, is one of the, the real giants in forestry. And, and his message for forestry generation, which I think is, is pretty pertinent, is shoot the deer, poison the beach, and manage the light, if you've ever been to one of his more recent talks. Well, I do it a, a little uh, more soft than that. Uh, I say reduce browse intensity control invasives or control competitors. And you wanna treat those before the canopy dies from things like emerald ash borer, gypsy moth, or before you put in your harvest. If you like looking at it, pictures, if you want oak, actually regeneration in, in general and diversity, you completely ignore all these guys. So only you can prevent forest fires. Well, if you want oak, you really having a uh, fire out there is a good thing. If you leave a lot of residual trees out there, uh, that's going to impact regeneration. If you really want to encourage wildlife, and we all love seeing deer when we work out there, but too many deer have a real bad impact. And hug an alien. Uh, encourage alien species if you don't want to have any invasives. So with that, let's get into the meat of the talk. I wasn't able to put together numbers for all of the Northeast, uh, but I did look at Southern New England and we now have a hundred year record of how stand sizes are changing over time. And one of the things I think most of us are aware of is that the number of saw timber or uh, stands, percentage of stands that are saw timber size has been increasing over the last hundred years, pretty steadily uh, since uh, right around 1960, 1950. And I think a lot of us have been aware that we really aren't seeing too many seedling sapling stands out there, that they're decreasing. And it's 
gone uh, they've gone down far enough that it's a concern to uh, Audubon Society for a lot of uh, early secessional songbirds, birds that like those young forests. What probably most people aren't aware of is because we haven't had a lot of seedling sapling stands, the number of pole timber size stands has actually been crashing over the last uh, 40 or 50 years. So there's been a lot of interest in, in regeneration. So let's start out with the first one, looking at uh, deer and invasives and the impact that they have on forest regeneration. Been a lot in the news lately about the fires uh, out west and the fires in Australia. And if somebody there remembers who it was, uh, somebody coined the phrase green fire. And that's what I think we're seeing here an awful lot in the uh, east, especially in the northeast. And green fire with the invasives. Japanese uh, knotweed along all of our stream quarters or wet areas. Oriental bittersweet climbing and choking out our trees. You get a little further south, they have kudzu instead. Uh, in a lot of areas, uh, roadside here in southern New England, we're seeing a lot of mugworts taking over everywhere and Japanese barberry. So all these invasive species are really being uh, some uh, major problems for us when we're trying to regenerate forest. So I do want to get into a few definitions, and I'll use them all interchangeably. I'll either say non-natives, aliens, or exotics. They're all pretty much interchangeable when I'm talking. But the thing is, not all non-natives are invasives. Norway spruces are planted everywhere. I've seen occasional Norway spruce seedlings out in the woods, but I don't think anyone would call Norway spruce an invasive. And whether or not natives can be invasive is a matter of debate. I personally think to be invasive, you have to be non-native. Some natives can have invasive-like uh, benefit or, or problems with it. And one of the questions people have is, how come some non-natives become a problem? How come they become invasives? Well, the big reason why is because nobody eats them. Uh, a lot of these were planted originally as ornamentals, uh, and people loved them. They didn't have to spray them for bugs or disease. And also they're deer browse resistant. So it was an ideal sort of plant. You could plant it and forget it. But that makes a problem when they adapt to our soils and our climate and they start moving out and reproducing in the woods. The other thing is when they become a problem is when you have deer. The one thing that uh, I've noticed throughout uh, most of southern New England where I spent the, the last 30 years is generally speaking, you don't have a real invasive problem unless you've got an out of control deer problem. But it's not deer by itself. You need to have a seed source and then you need to have a disturbance. It can be where a windstorm goes through, where you have an insect outbreak or where you have a harvest. You've already got some invasives on site. The deer are eating all the native stuff. And I'll talk more about that later. And that's when you have an outbreak of an alien invasive species. Now, the way that the deer impact the ecosystem is they, they really do three things, is they mow everything down. We've probably all been in areas where the deer herd is out of control. And by mowing everything down, they leave a lot of growing space available for new seedlings. But at the same time, they're eating uh, a lot of the uh, seeds before they ripen or the flowers, so they lower the reproductive output of all the browse species. And they do that for both native and non-native. However, a lot of uh, non-native seeds will actually be uh, ripe when the deer consume them. Then the deer will travel uh, miles before they eventually defecate them out. And they can cause uh, plant colonies to occur where the deer will eat the invasive seeds, transport them miles, and then poop them out. So here's just one example. The first thing I talk about, where deer go out, there's a lot of growing space out there. And anyone, this is a sugar maple stand. Um, it's about 80 90% stocked, and there should be a shrub layer in there. There should be a sub canopy. Everything you see green in the understory there is a non native species. Almost all of it is Japanese barberry, and uh, there's also a little bit of Maltifora rose. What happened out here in this stand is a 17 year cicada had one of the largest outbreaks on record in, in Connecticut, killed more than half these trees. This Excuse me, this stand now is just a mess of invasives. Nothing else is growing out there. And we all know neighbor abhors a vacuum, so something's gonna grow in there. And what'll grow in there? 
Well, we did a sort of a, a weird experiment for a second thing that deer can transport things long distance species. And we went out and collected a whole bunch of deer pellet groups, put them in the fridge, put them in the greenhouse, and we saw seeds starting to grow out of them. And one of the things we found is from 566 pellet groups, we had over 11,000 seedlings emerge out of them. You'd never think when you see deer pellets out there, but they're actually loaded with seeds that are, these plants have evolved to actually go through the digestive system and then germinate. 86 different taxa were growing out of deer pellets. And the scary thing is the majority of the uh, taxa and the majority of the seedlings were not native to the U.S. So most of what deer are spreading across the landscape are non-native species. And one of the scarier ones they're spreading is Japanese stiltgrass. Probably those of you in the north haven't seen it yet. I mean, aesthetically, this looks really beautiful, but it's a biological desert. And between the stiltgrass suppressing young seedlings and between the deer eating everything coming up, the only thing that can really grow out here besides silkgrass is bittersweet that can push its way up. But we found other things in deer pellets. Autumn olive, multiflora rose, wineberry, and Japanese honeysuckle. All these had seeds which the deer would consume the, these, the fruit and the seeds, would go through the digestive system, they would poop them out, and then they would germinate from deer pellets. So we ended up with these stands of invasive species. And I was able to get my wife to go out in the middle of this Japanese barberry, multiflora rose, bittersweet stand. But a question, you know, your uh, landowners, if you're private, they might ask you, or, you know, the heads of your agencies might ask is, why do you care? I mean, it's green out there. It looks good. Well, there's a couple reasons. And this, this, I think, is important when you're trying to convince people why to go out and control invasives so that you can get your forest regeneration. Well, the, the one that hits most people is that the fact uh, where you have a lot of invasives, you have a lot more ticks. And our work where we've done it is there's about 120 ticks per acre carrying Lyme disease in areas with Japanese barberry, compared to only about 10 ticks per acre in a forest without barberry. That's a scary thing. And that actually has gotten a lot of people uh, here in Connecticut and a, a bit in Rhode Island to actually go out and start controlling some of these invasive species. Human health makes a big thing when you're trying to convince people to invest in controlling invasives. Another thing is uh, areas with invasive species. Uh, from our work, uh, we found about twice as high a biomass of earthworm where there's invasives compared to areas uh, where there aren't invasives. So why do you care about earthworms? Earthworms are, are great in our yards and garden. Uh, Thomas Edison said there's worth as much as fertilizer having out there. The trouble is our forest developed without very many native earthworms. There's a few really small ones, but not all these European and Asiatic ones. And when you have too many earthworms, they destroy the litter layer. Uh, that can lead to sheet erosion and then actually gully formation. And what will happen when you start having that erosion is you have too much barberry, it leads to earthworms, loss of the litter layer, then you have erosion, and then you have uh, the sediment washing into our rivers, you have nitrates, uh, earthworms actually increase uh, nitrification, and you have phosphorus washing into all of our riparian areas. So it's a, another argument to tell people why we want to go out and control invasives. And I know some of the uh, water companies in Connecticut have been going after invasives just because of this water quality issue. The other thing about uh, having too many deer out there, like I'd mentioned earlier, is the fact that they really chow down on native species. That white pine you see in the lower left was a, a 2-0 white pine that we planted in an open field. And there's no way on God's green earth that an 11-year-old white pine, you know, 11 years after planting, is only about a foot tall. The deer just repeatedly, repeatedly browsed on it. For me, the amazing thing is that that white pine is still alive. So we did some studies of, uh, you know, we put up a fence. I'll show a little bit more about that later. And you can look at between inside and outside the fence. There's a lot of things growing inside the fence. We're actually getting good regeneration as opposed to outside the fence where we control the invasives, very little regeneration. I think most of us have seen these exposure studies. And so we have an instinctive understanding that deer are having a, a real impact 
on uh, forest regeneration. But deer are also having an impact on other things we don't think about. It. In controlling deer is a, is a real political issue in a, most areas. Um, there's people who are very much um, do not want any hunting at all. Uh, they're morally opposed to it. But if you have too many deer, that can have a, an impact on other things besides forest regeneration. There's a number of studies, the majority of studies show that when you have too many, uh, oh, I'm sorry, this here's coming kind of later. This is on invasives, why I want to control invasives. When you have uh, a lot of non-natives out there, they actually have a, a negative impact on uh, bird species. So there's been studies in Ohio and New Jersey uh, showing that invasive species uh, lead to uh, declines in uh, the number of birds and the nesting success. There was one study in Pennsylvania showed that Lanoseria, uh, honeysuckle, was an important food source for birds. But you have to balance that off against uh, the fact that you're going to have lower regeneration success. A thing that's been a lot in the news lately have been uh, pollinators. Let me bring this one up first. And when you have too many deers, we lose a lot of our native wildflowers out there. And there's a lot of people really appreciate wildflowers. But those wildflowers are also important for our native pollinators. If you've got a stand uh, dominated by an invasive species, you're going to have a very short flowering window when that invasive species is out there. As opposed to the native wildflowers, so in this one here we have uh, spring wildflowers, and then we have a late fall wildflower, they're going to be flowering all year long. So there's a source of nectar and a source of pollen for uh, the pollinators all year long. And to get back what I think most of us are, are concerned about, or a big part of what we're concerned about, is the fact when you have too many deer, you have no trees. And this was an area on one of the local water companies. Uh, it's actually, uh, I observed this for about 10 years. I looked at this carpet of sugar maple seedlings out there. And I was wondering, hmm, wonder how old they are. So we went out and pulled up about half a dozen of them. They're only six inches high, sliced them in half, looked at it under a microscope. These are 17-year-old sugar maple seedlings. It's just because the deer would repeatedly browse them year after year after year. Not a good thing. In other areas, if you have a lot of fern, if you ever go on, especially in uh, parts of Pennsylvania, uh, parts of New York, you'll get these vast ferneries where you can see 200 yards through the woods and all you see is hay-scented fern and sometimes some other ferns. No shrub layer, no regeneration, and it's all because he had too many deer out there. So what do you do when you have uh, way too many invasives out there to control them? Well, what we did is we did a number of things. Uh, we went out on the really dense sites and uh, rented a feed con with a, uh, attached to a bobcat skitter. It's a fun piece of equipment to drive, although it's expensive. It's actually cheaper to hire somebody to do it. Uh, but you can mow it right down. And I think that's the first step you wanna do if you've got this five, six foot high stuff is mow it down and control it as much as you can. Well, we have found to be uh, also effective because if he can, can't get up against the invasive near trees or you can't use it, you know, wetland areas unless the ground's frozen hard, is get out there with a brush saw and you can mow it down. It's a great first step. And so this is what we did for uh, the work I'm gonna talk about. And that's what it looks like after you get done mowing it. It looks pretty clean, you can see there's actually a whole bunch of Canada Mayflowers coming up. Another section near here had Dutchman's Britches, which is our native uh, bleeding heart, came up. But we also wanted to look at the impact of controlling deer. So we got a bunch of us together, strung some fence out. It gets pretty expensive. Had a great crew helping on that. Folks over Aquarian Water Company and the Nature Conservancy. And because uh, the water company, one of the water companies didn't want a herbicide use at the time, we went out there and used backpack flamethrowers. And we killed every one of the barberry. Uh, we went in July, and those who survived the first go around, we went back in October, flamed them again. Uh, back, well, I won't go into too much, but black flat, backpack flamethrowers are a great tool, but I think they're more for wetlands than in the woods. They're kind of expensive. The one thing if you do put up any fences is realize that there is a maintenance issue. 
if you're going to put up uh, fences to keep deer out. Anytime a large branch goes down or trees go down, unless you're going to be using uh, Pete's new style slash fences, uh, there's a real uh, maintenance cost involved. So what do we find after uh, nine years? And this is the text, and then I'll show pictures showing it. Is that if you put fences around intact invasive shrubs and see what type of regeneration you had, you wouldn't have any forest regeneration nine years later. Once those invasive shrubs are in place, they completely uh, exclude any regeneration from being able to, to establish. They have dense canopy cover, which shades them out. There, there's too much root competition. You just don't get in regeneration just by excluding deer as invasives are already there. If you do control the invasives, you get a real flush of small seedlings. You get a lot of new small seedlings coming in. But the problem is if you don't control the deer the same time you're controlling invasives, the deer munch down the seedlings. So you'll get the seedlings coming in, but they won't get much past that six inches. So really what you need to do is you need to control both deer and invasives. If you have an invasive problem, chances are you have a deer problem. And if you were to control the invasives and not control the deer, you're really wasting your time. You've got to control the deer somehow. One of the other things we found is that um, the uh, species that were able to come up through were those that uh, the deer really didn't like to eat. Deer are browsers, they'll selectively eat. They have preference for eating some species over another. So species like beech and hot horn beam, uh, phagus and uh, oh, australia were the ones which were really coming up in areas uh, where the deer were still able to munch on them. Oh, here's a complicated graph. So let's just, if you want to read one of the papers, I can send you the papers that'll explain it all, but let me explain it to you in pictures. So if you look at the, the top uh, uh, squares and uh, diamonds that are in white, those are areas that we mowed. I'm sorry, those are areas where we uh, didn't mow, didn't do any control. We either put a fence up or we didn't put a fence up. And as I just said, we saw no difference uh, either inside or outside the fence. We just did not get in any regeneration. The invasives uh, did continue to do just fine. If we went out there and uh, we just mowed, uh, whether or not uh, we controlled deer, we just mowed it once, the invasives come back again. And uh, in just a second, I'll show you a, a slide over a couple of years, we can actually watch the invasives just growing back where we mowed it down and didn't do anything else where we had deer. Now, if you uh, mow it down and then hit it twice with directed flame, or if you're to mow it down and go out there uh, with uh, a herbicide application, it's a lot more efficient, um, you'll actually get some real regeneration coming back. But if, if it's inside a fence, but if it's outside the fence, there's a, another problem, and I'll point that one out here in just a second. So let's look through what happens if you just mow it and you don't do anything else. So it looks really nice the spring after you mow it. You can see on the left, you can see some barberry poking up, and in the foreground, it looks nice and clean. Four months later, though, you've got a carpet of six to eight inch high barberry or multiflora rows, and I imagine it'd be the same thing for buckthorn or honeysuckle just coming right back up. All these species re-sprout from, from the roots. So if all you do is mow it, they're just gonna grow back. Two years later, if you look in the background, uh, you can see how the, in this case, it's barberry and some all four rows. It's now almost two feet high. Four years later, you're back to another tangle again of three to four foot high invasives all over. So again, these are areas where we just mowed the invasives and didn't do anything else. Now, what sort of regeneration? One thing you should notice is look at the lack of regeneration. Whatever regeneration tried to come up, if you look in the two-year one, it's open enough that deer can continue to munch down all the regeneration we're trying to get. And what will happen after uh, eight, ten years is you're back to where you started again, which is these massive invasive uh, infestations across the landscape and no regeneration. And the few open spots between the invasives or where deer will just go through and they'll just mow everything down. So if we look inside and outside the fence where it's there, well, we have regeneration coming on uh, the inside. 
one of the things, though, if you uh, are still out deer on the outside, and uh, Tom Rolinski is the one that pointed this out, and we've seen this in a number of spots, is where deer can still uh, have access and do browsing, Japanese stilt grass, if it's in your area, really can start taking over an area where you control invasives if you have too many deers. So we want to look at what's the Goldilocks solution so we can have sort of the right number of deer. And I'll tell you why we want to have the right number of deer is this is a little bit of a complicated graph. I have a couple of them. Like I said, again, you can email me. I can send you a copy of it or you can look at it. But if we start at the left bottom, we have an area where we had no control. We didn't mow the barberry and all the invasives. We had partial control. Partial control, that's the, the middle two. That's where we mowed it. And then the intense control is where we mowed it, and then we treated it a couple of times with propane. Alternatively, you could have used a herbicide. So if you look at uh, native uh, vines and shrubs, we'll get the trees here in the next slide. Those are the, the top two bars that are the lighter blue. Uh, where we had no control, those are the ones on the left. Inside and outside, really uh, no change. And the same you'll see the invasives, no change. Where we just mowed it, if you look at inside, that's the one that says partial and inside, you can start to see now we're seeing a little bit more native vines and shrubs. And then if, if you look at the intense one where we mowed it and hit it with propane twice, you can see more uh, native vines and shrubs coming in. But there is a problem. These areas also started to have an increase of invasive sh vines and invasive shrubs, especially where we uh, killed all the invasive uh, shrubs, the intense one on the right, mowed it and then hit it twice. The surprise for us was th how the Japanese honeysuckle and the Oreo and bittersweet uh, exploded. But if you go back and you look at what uh, people were promoting back in the 60s for wildlife, they're actually planting Japanese honeysuckle and oriental bittersweet and food plots for deer. Deer like to eat both of them. So they, in a way, help keep them a little bit under control. Now here again on the bottom, we have no control to the right, partial control in the center, that's where it's just mode, intense control to the, sorry, no control to the left, intense control to the right, and that's where it was mode and then hit twice with uh, propane torches. <clears throat> if you look on the far left bar, which is intense control and then inside uh, the uh, exclosure, that's where we had the most uh, tree seedlings. They were at least three feet high, and this is after nine growing season, and we had the most diversity. The thing is, it takes a while for things to recover. Uh, these were, generally speaking, about 50% canopy cover. Uh, one of them had more, one of them had less. And actually, it's, it's, it takes a while for the seedlings to uh, recover because there have been so long that they've been mowed down and basically died from the deer, they didn't recover. But we did get a lot more diversity out there and more seedlings where we both controlled the invasives and kept the deer away. Now here's a, a scary spot and you, you sort of wonder, if hopefully not too many of you have, it's a place in Connecticut, they had 450 deer per square mile. They had 18 deer on a 16 acre island and it was complete invasive. That's all lanthus trees you see there, oriental bittersweet, as a vine in Japanese barberry. So what can you do? Well, that would be a talk for another day. So let's go on, we're talking on Goldilocks. How do we have some deer out there, some deer to control those invasive vines, but not too many deer that they're eating the natives. So we decided we wanted to look at uh, areas that were, had a history of being hunted and areas that had a history of uh, where hunting wasn't allowed. And we also wanted to look at the same time the impact of residual stand structure. <clears throat> so here's what I was talking about, uh, the impact of uh, deer and songbirds, is basically when you have too many deers, most deer, most of the studies have indicated that too many deer really have a negative impact on songbirds, primarily uh, by removing that shrub layer where uh, the shrub nesters and the ground nesters uh, forage and where they nest. 
So it's another reason to go after deer is it has a negative impact on um, songbirds. So like I said, we went out there and looked at regeneration. In this study, I think when I give you the results of this, uh, to let you know, I, we have pretty high confidence. We just heard uh, back on Monday that our paper got accepted. So that'll be coming out in a little bit. So we looked at 108 stands where they'd put in regeneration harvest uh, across uh, Connecticut. We looked at uh, 221 points, I'll describe those more, covering 4,000 acres. So I think it's a, a pretty good sample size. Our uh, sampling intensity was about uh, one point for every two acres. There's where the stands are located, uh, scattered throughout the state of Connecticut. The uh, red circles were all the stands where uh, hunting was allowed. And the uh, green squares were all stands where hunting wasn't allowed. Uh, the unhunted stands were a combination of water company properties, uh, some land trust, and some state forests and parks where the land was given to the state uh, with the, uh, in the deed it said that they weren't allowed to hunt. And we wanted to look at stands uh, between uh, two and 12 years old. That's a critical time when uh, trees are growing and they're competing with each other and you have thousands of trees out there. And by the time of canopy closure, which around here is you know eight to 15 years, so we pick 12 years as arbitrary, those trees that are in the upper canopy, at canopy closure, are those which are, those are the trees which in the future are gonna form the uh, upper canopy of the mature forest. Those are the trees which are gonna be the eventual saw timber trees. So what we did is we uh, tallied every stem that was at least three feet high. We looked at the different height classes, whether or not they're free to grow, and I'll explain that in a second. And when we went into shelterwood stands, we presumed that all the residuals uh, would be cut when we were assuming whether or not the tree was free to grow. So what's free to grow? Well, free to grow is any tree which has uh, at least part of uh, its canopy. Some of its leaves are in direct sun. So they're strong intermediates, if you want to think of it that way, codominants and dominants. So it, it didn't matter, you know, what size it was, it's what, it, what were the trees around it that were competing with it. If you look at the picture in the lower right, that was a three-year-old stand. It was a large 40-acre clear cut where hunting was not allowed. Uh, there was an oak out there. The orange hat is where an oak was. Uh, but it didn't have anybody who was over top of it, so it was growing in the full sun. The picture on the left, the orange hat is also the, on the top branch uh, of an oak but it was completely overtopped uh, by surrounding uh, birch. And I think there's a red maple on that pot too. We looked at some other things to uh, assess um, the amount of uh, over residual overstory. We did a 10 factor prism on each one of the points. And we also looked at ferns and shrubs density. So the, the one thing you, you do need to know is we uh, split the stands into three different categories. We looked at open stands. Uh, I'm gonna call them clear cuts. They were actually, uh, except for a couple of the stands that were done for uh, New England Cottontail, they were all stands which had had a previous shelter wood and then they had the final overstore removal. So I'll call them open. Sometimes I'll call them clear cut just because it's easier. Then we had two edge stands. Again, uh, these stands, uh, actually all of these stands, had had a shelter wood cut beforehand to initiate regeneration. Then they had the harvest, uh, but there's no uh, intent to go back and uh, remove the residuals on these stands for at least another 40, 50 years. And then we had the shelter wood stands, uh, which are a typical shelter wood, 50 to 90 square feet uh, an acre. The ones with 90 square feet, uh, there's a possibility of going back in and actually making a three-step shelter wood, but they still had the residual overstory trees, which are uh, scheduled uh, to be cut sometime in the future. Oh, so here's another graph. And here's the bad news for almost every combination we found of hunting and not hunting. Birch and beech is the future, at least in our neck of the woods. So let me explain this graph a little bit. The, uh, the y-axis going up the side, that stems per acre, and these are free to grow stems. So these are, are stems 
which are, are getting sunlight up there. Strong intermediates, co-dominance, and, and dominance. You want to think of it that way, or free to grow. On the bottom, we have areas where hunting is allowed on the left and areas where hunting is not allowed uh, on the right. And then we have open, those are the clear cuts or final overstore removal, the two edge stands, and then the shelter wood. And in five out of those six combinations, birch and beech accounted for 50 to 75% of those trees, which are in the free to grow status. 50 to 75% of the trees. There are very few trees of other species, especially very few oaks in those. The one bright spot is if you looked where hunting was allowed, so these are areas that had a history of hunting, and they did a final overstore removal, so they were clear cut at the end. There we had uh, a good diversity of species. You know, birch and beech were still uh, pretty numerous, but there was the same, uh, there was a, a lot higher numbers of uh, all the other species. Uh, the maple, you know, unfortunately a lot of it was red maple, but we did have uh, some oak, uh, some cherry, uh, tulip poplar, and other species coming through. The one thing to note on here is if you look at uh, how many uh, birch there were per acre, it really didn't vary, except for the shelter with no hunting, it really didn't vary among uh, what was the final, uh, the, over, the residual stand, and it didn't vary by hunting. The same for beech. So those species, really their densities are independent of residual stand density and whether or not they're hunted. The reason why they dominate an area where there's no hunting or in areas with a high residual stand is everybody else just got hammered. So let's look at some of the, the stand level metrics we found from this. And this is a, a good argument uh, for hunting and actually for putting in a, a clear cut in your final one. So if we looked at three metrics of species diversity. Uh, those of you who are geeks like me will know uh, what Shannon Weaver and Evenus is. The important thing to notice is that areas that were hunted had higher uh, Every the three common metrics of species diversity were all higher in areas that were hunted than in areas that were not hunted. Much higher species diversity. In areas uh, where you had the final overstore removal, where you had a clear cut, also had higher diversity metrics uh, than areas that were not hunted. I'm sorry, had higher diversity metrics in areas that were clear cut than in areas that uh, had high residual overstory density. Another important thing, and this was kind of interesting. Uh, I think anecdotally, a lot of us had noted, and I'd mentioned earlier that areas uh, where there's no hunting, where there's too many deer, tend to have a lot more invasives. And this is actually something we were able to, to show from this study. So if you look on uh, the left, that's the proportion of that 108 stands uh, that had invasive cover. And down below, we have where areas hunting is allowed and areas that weren't hunted. And so if we look at the left bar, we look at the top, which is red, the next is the top, which is sort of an orange, and then uh, the next one, which is a yellow. So those are areas that have uh, at least 5% invasive cover. So 20% of our stands had invasive cover of at least 5% where hunting was allowed. If we look at the right bar, over 40% of the stands where hunting was not allowed had invasive cover. So there's all, invasive cover was much, much higher on stands uh, where hunting wasn't allowed, which is uh, another pretty good indicator that if you don't allow hunting, you're gonna have more problems with invasives. And I'm just looking here really quick, uh, Elizabeth, uh, send me an email later, I can explain what evenness is. Evenness is actually a statistical distribution of uh, how species are, the number of species are just, the, let me explain it later, I'm, I'm gonna get confused myself. So let me take a minute break here to have a drink. You guys can read this. Getting back really quickly to evenness is if you had five species, 
and there's the same number of trees in each one of the species, you would have uh, perfect evenness. If you had uh, five species and one species had 95 trees and the other species had one tree apiece, then that would be a, a very uneven stand as far as evenness. So here's the challenge. It's, I have it here for oak, but it's really for a lot of our, our species, is, but especially oak. It's often hampered by taller red maple birch and less valuable species. I look a lot at oak. So let's look here with sort of the same graph descriptions we had before. We're looking at the proportions of, of stands, of all the stands. And if we look, these are areas that were clear cut. They, we call them open. They're either hunted or not hunted. In areas that were hunted, 80% of those stands had at least 50 oaks per acre that were free to grow. Those are the, the light blue, the bottom bar, and the green, which is the second of the bottom bar. Compared to uh, areas where hunting was not allowed, less than 50% of those stands uh, had 50 oaks per acre. And I think that's a pretty low bar to hit. Uh, you know, we're talking 12-year-old stands. A lot of those trees, as they go, the stands go through stand development, go through uh, canopy stratification. I think you're going to see at least half of those uh, trees are going to fall out. If they're oaks, uh, it could even be 75%. Uh, you know, we just don't know. Nobody's looked at stands that young. So that's a, a minimum standard of 50 trees per acre. But you can see there's a big difference in areas that are hunted versus areas that aren't hunted. Now let's look at uh, just areas that are hunted. So we're gonna go from the left, areas that were open. So think of clear cut areas, two age stands and shelter wood stands. And two age stands, which is, uh, you know, where you've got uh, pockets out there, you've got 25 to 50 square feet of residual basal area. It's become uh, popular as sort of aesthetically, it looks nice out there. Um, on public lands, they've done it for aesthetics. On private lands, they do also do it for aesthetics. The trouble is this has a real negative impact on uh, your odds of having a stand, which is gonna have at least 50 oaks per acre out there that are free to grow. You're going from 80 to 65% by leaving those residual trees. And these are only stands that are less than 12 years after that, that last harvest. Some of the work coming out of uh, West Virginia where they originally uh, described this, those two H stands, they called them residual uh, shelter woods. After 20 years, it looks like there's even more of an impact of leaving those residual trees. The first 10 years, those crowns don't expand, much, the, resi the crowns of residual trees don't expand much in diameter. What they do is they sort of fill in the center. So if, if you look at a lot of uh, forest trees and you look at where the leaves are, it's like an umbrella where you see this outer layer of trees, it's uh, you know three to four feet thick, sort of on the outside. And then when you put in that, that heavy harvest, the trees fill in so they look like a ball of cotton candy. But that, then after about 10 years, then the crowns start to actually uh, grow wider, uh, in part because they get so much weight, they start to flop out, in part because they grow out more. One of the interesting things is that shelterwood stands, only about 30% of those stands had at least 100, uh, at least 50 oaks per acre. But then recall again, I said that the open stands always had a shelterwood before they were open. So uh, how much of this was from oak stump sprouts that allowed for the increased percentage? Uh, I can't say. But here's one of the, another one of the bottom lines. So let's look at the, uh, the one on the far left. So that's an area that was clear cut and where hunting was allowed. 80% of those stands, again, uh, had at least 50 oaks per acre. And that's a, a pretty low bar, but at least it's a, it's a bar. Then if we look at the two age stands in the center where there's no hunting. So if you were to have an irregular shelterwood, a two age stand, and you had a history of no hunting on the property, less than 20% of those stands are gonna have at least 50 oaks per acre. So you're pretty much guaranteed that if you've got an area uh, where you don't allow hunting and uh, you put in a two-age uh, stand in regular shelterwood, 
the the chances of having uh, adequate oak in that next stand is pretty low. So just uh, to summarize what we've gone through there again, we've had this before. If you want oak and stand diversity, uh, you know, leave the trees, leave a lot of residual trees, uh, leave a lot of alien species out there. Don't control the alien invasives. Encourage wildlife. Don't allow hunting. And I put in smoky just because some of other ones was, phew, had done it. So let's see. I'll go through this really quick so we have time for a couple questions I can answer them. It's just my thing. During stump sprouting, this is a paper we had came out uh, last year in uh, Forest Science. Don't you wish every one of your oaks, four-year-old sprouts looked like that? Well, that was actually where we put a cage completely around uh, oak stumps. And it's amazing how fast uh, oak sprouts will grow if there's no browsing on them. Let me skip over that for time. So what we did is we found the stumps and right after the harvest, we put, uh, we sized the cage around each one at least six feet high. And we let the trees grow. And here it is after one year. JP's pointing out an oak stump in the in the foreground. You can see how the deer are just really hammering it. But I look at the stump in the background, and that was something we found wasn't uncommon, where the deer could not eat the sprouts out of a stump. Three to six foot high sprouts was the norm. And it's just something we don't expect because we're so used to seeing how much damage uh, deer do uh, out there. We just sort of consider that that's what's normal. That's what's natural. Maybe it is. The really weird thing is eventually there's so much vegetation out there, those oak stump sprouts will start to grow. And here's a graph that's year since harvest on the bottom and the height of the tallest sprout in feet for, for, the, uh, for the oaks. And you look at the difference between cage, which are the red triangles and where they were protected in the blue squares. And it really only reduced the growth rate by one year. So you're there, well, you know, really do we want a cage? But you have to remember, everybody else is growing out there. All the birches, all the red maples, all that you get out into Ohio, uh, the, the locust, everybody else is growing. And they're actually able to overtop the oaks. And this is uh, the last graph on the, the thing. It's, so let me explain it. So we have oaks that were caged and oaks that had no protection. So we looked at... Uh, the, the left axis is a percentage of stumps which had a free to grow oak sprout. And it's how many of these oak sprouts were at least a height, if not taller than all of their competitors. And if we look at the uh, one on the right where it said no protection, over 50% of those stumps that did sprout, so I should mention we only looked at stumps which had sprouts because not all the stumps had sprout. Over 50% of those stumps that didn't sprout were either in the gray uh, top square or in the red uh, next square. So those stumps that either died because they've been repeatedly browsed or had no sprouts, which were able to be competitive with all the, their neighbors. Compared to uh, ones that were caged, 75% of those stumps had uh, sprouts which were uh, competitive. They were at least the same height as all the competitors or not taller. So just by reducing the uh, height growth of oaks by one year, the relative height growth, it was enough to set them back so that they uh, weren't competitive. So the take home message again, going back to Ralph Nyland, his was shoot the deer, poison the beach, manage the light. I put it a little bit softer. You really want to reduce and browse intensity. If you've got too many deer out there, the oaks and our other valuable species like sugar maple, just are not gonna be competitive with those species like birch and beech and hop worm beam, which the deer do not like to eat as much. You wanna control invasives, or if you have uh, another competitor out there, you wanna control those to allow the valuable species to grow. And you wanna do both of those, both the browse intensity, and uh, the invasives before the canopy dies or before you put in your first harvest. So with that, uh, there's my uh, phone number and email if someone uh, wants to uh, request anything and I'll try to answer any questions.
Peter, are you back online? I'm back online now, Jeff. Thank you. That was a great presentation. I appreciate that. And there's already lots of questions and thoughts being offered. Um, so one of them, and I'll just uh, I'll use the host prerogative to ask the first question. Sure. I, I, I see the, the stump sprouts, multiple stems. What do you, how does that, how does that play out in terms of, of stem quality decades into the future? I mean, is that, I mean, it's better than nothing. I admit good for, you know, it contributes to diversity. You've got an acorn crop, but I'm just always a little leery that stump sprouts are going to be high quality stems or structurally stable stems. Any, any sense on that? Uh, just from what I've seen, I mean, we've been actually been following some, uh, 10 year old it was 10 years when we started 10, 12 year old stuff. And now it's uh, 30 years later. So it's, uh, you know, 40 to 50 year old stuff. If this uh, sprout is low on the stump, it's stable. Um, you might have to, you know, butt off. If you're looking at economic return, you might have to, you know, cut off the lower foot or two. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't seen a problem through that age. I actually had a phone call this morning from a forester asking what to do where they put up a big exclosure and they had uh, too many oak stump sprouts. Uh, he'd never seen them look that good before. <laughs> and I'm there, um, you know, wait five, six years and then prune them down to one or two per uh, stump because which one you think is dominant is sort of surprising, Pete. They'll go back and forth on which one's the dominant or co-dominant. So let them sort themselves out until they're like 20 feet high or so, if, if you're able to. And then go back out and look at the form. Some of the one that's the dominant one might be one that's got a wicked uh, fork, you know, eight feet off the ground. Pop that one out of there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there will be certainly be some self-thinning mm -hmm. as well. So, all right. Let's, uh, can you see the questions or do you want me to read? I can just see the bottom ones. All right, if you put your cursor on the panel, you can scroll up and down. Okay, let me go. Do, 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 do. Okay, so I saw the evenness there. I sort of explained that one, and I'm not doing a good job because I'm not in the statistics right now. Okay, yeah, Steve Young had a, a, a great comment about regular hunting will not result. On, before, before you go to that one, there was an earlier one from Chris Zimmerman about oh. uh, publications. You And I just want to confirm, you had sent me an email that had <laughs> several publications attached. Right. Is it, it's okay if I send those? If yes, I, sir. If I put those on a blog and make them available to um, anybody that goes to the blog and I'll send that link out to everybody that registered. Yeah, so, and I will send, I mean, the one on hunting, like I said, was accepted on Monday into uh, the Bolton Wildlife Society, Wildlife Society Bolton. Okay. So that one I can't pass out yet until after it's published. Right. Uh, but there's actually... The question that uh, Steve Young had there about regular hunting won't result in the deer density need to get good regeneration. What's interesting, if you look uh, at those studies, they're, um, you know, talk, they look at the target goal, which is, I believe it's uh, 12 deer per square mile is what you need for regeneration and eight deer per square mile to get in the uh, wildflowers or I have them reversed. And recreational hunting can't bring deer density down below, I think it's right around 16 deer per square mile. What's interesting out here is these are areas uh, where hunted, and I think the deer just get leery on going back into those areas where they're hunted, and it reduces the browse pressure just enough uh, as opposed to those earlier studies were all enclosure studies. That was... Uh, Oh, shoot. Susan Stout was one of them. I'm trying to marry the other folks in Pennsylvania. Um, as opposed to, you know, we are looking at uh, stands in a landscape situation. So there's no exclosures or enclosures. And all I can tell you, this is, is what we found. The areas that were, had regular hunting pressure on them. And it's not, you know, uh, you think about during the, the deer season, but I think when you have people out there, uh, doing spring turkey hunting, that makes the deer sort of nervous and they wander out of there. You know, you've got the uh, earlier fall, uh, small game hunting and upland bird hunting. And I think the, the deers, whenever they start hearing the, uh, the guns go off, just evacuate out of the area. So it reduces the amount of time that they feel out there. 
that they spend out there. And I think it also reduces the amount of time because they just don't feel comfortable out there. So what is hunted? Minimum number of hunters. That's also a great question. How many, this is a, a landscape problem. So we have no idea. All we know is that these were uh, primarily uh, state forests that have always been open to hunting. Um, to answer that question and how many were hunted, we'd have to be able to go back, uh, you know, in some cases 12 years and try to figure out how many were taken out and what was the deer density. So we just wanted to look at the landscape level of what was the impact of hunting versus non-hunted. And we don't have near as many hunters as we probably should have out there. Okay, I'll skip that. Do we have estimated forest canopy? Yeah, that's going to be another one from Chris Zimmer. We're actually going to do that one the next paper out there. Let's see, 450 oak recruitment. Well, there's oak but seedling. Would, but so when you would, but, and that was a, something I was wondering about. Sure. Chris is, Chris is trying to think about this from a, how to manage. So if the two age stand, um, you, and you showed a, a slide, I don't know if it was the base. It was 25 to 50 square foot residual basal area. On the two aged and then the shelter right. wood treatment. Was 50 was to 90. 50 to 90 square feet. Okay. Right. And then the, what you're calling clear cut was, most of those had had a prior entry, a preparatory entry it, for... Except for a couple of them where they did a true clear cut because uh, New England Contailed, they were considering listing it in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. So uh, NRCS was paying people to put in clear cuts, which is pretty amazing. But these were 20 to 50 acre clear cuts hmm. and there was no prep cut on them. They just went out there and zapped everything. Okay. So it's a good question. So Rick Tyler had the uh, comment here about uh, 450 oak seedlings. So we weren't looking at at seedlings. We were actually looking at post uh, harvest. Uh, what was out there? The surprise was in uh, the shelter woods. You know, we weren't seeing too many competitive oaks. So we were looking at three feet and bigger. It's not that four and a half foot standard, which. Uh, had been uh, the standard from Ivan Sanders out in Missouri, and uh, hopefully Pat Bros is going to yell at me for saying this. He's uh, working on a paper now, which is going to show that four and a half foot standard actually is a, a pretty good one, even in Pennsylvania. Uh, so we looked at three feet and higher, and we had a lot lower numbers. But it, the the question is, when you have the when you say 450 oaks per acre, is do you want a pure oak stand out there? And maybe you need 450 oaks per acre to have a stand, which is going to be potentially 100% uh, oak stocking. There's some real questions here in Connecticut now on whether or not we want to go with that high oak stocking. Because uh, in large part, gypsy moth. Uh, those of you who haven't heard, uh, eastern Connecticut, Rhode Island, and parts of Matt's got hammered again by gypsy moth. And the question is, do we really want to be running these stands which are more than 50% oak out there. Uh, those are the stands which are really susceptible to gypsy moth. And you want to put all of your eggs in the basket on that. So maybe we only want to have 25 oaks per acre as uh, uh, our standard going forward. And when you consider that uh, the 25 trees per acre, if you look at the actual value, the 25 most valuable trees per acre in our uh, mixed species stand, accounts for what, 60, 70% of the stand value? So why do we need to have 120 oaks per acre in a mature stand? Maybe we only want to have 25 oaks and let all the other trees be nurse trees and, and shade trees so we don't have as much uh, non-oak regeneration out there. I don't know the answer, but I do know that people are trying to go a little bit away from that high oak standard. Are we working with the state managers to reduce the deer herd? Well, that's a political thing. <laughs> Do you know how, how many deer, I don't know how many deer were taken. Tell us about the bear in the first slide, just really quick. That was because my crew wimped out. They went out, there's a 350 pound boar out there, uh, male uh, bear, and they decided to leave, but they stayed long enough to make sure they could get good pictures. <laughs> Actually, I don't blame them a bit. Uh, we couldn't control for hunting pressure. Is laurel beneficial in a home woodland? Uh, well, in the home woodland, I think you're not looking as much at um, trying to get uh, regeneration. 
I think that's probably more for aesthetics and firewood and wildlife. Laurel will be beneficial. The one thing I do know about laurel is if you don't thin your stand regularly, uh, when you have a closed canopy, laurel slowly declines and it does not flower as well. So if you want good looking mountain laurel, you have to thin. What were the deer density differences between 100 and 900? That's actually a great question. And we thought about going out there and doing a pellet count. The trouble is some of these stands, like I said, had been had the final cut 12 years ago and it had a prep shoulder wood cut maybe 15 years ago. And there's no way we can go back in time and know what the previous um, deer density was historically. And the state of Connecticut quit doing even um, district-wide uh, deer density counts because they were being screamed at uh, by both the pro-deer and the anti-deer people on their counts. And they just said, we, they didn't want to put up with a hassle anymore and they couldn't do it. 20 year per square mile regeneration without invasive. And for doing that. You missed, uh, Marie says, how many years will oh. oak tree stumps continue to regenerate sprouts? That's a great question. And you know what? I don't know the answer. I suspect three or four years. I think sometimes they can go longer. Sometimes if it's not a strong stump, it'll be one or two years. The problem is if the deer keep hammering them. The one thing we did find, and actually, uh, thanks for pointing out uh, Marie's question there, is if you wait until uh, the middle of summer, bef you know, right after the harvest, wait till, you know, like June or July, before you put the cages up, if you're gonna put cages up, so you identify which uh, stumps are gonna sprout. Because we found that 50 to 70% of the stumps did not produce a sprout. So we'd put cages up a lot of dead stumps and then we had to move cages oh. and it didn't have an impact on how the growth was. So even though the, the uh, new sprouts were lightly browsed, there's not a lot of browse damage during the summer in a clear cut because there's so much other food available on the oaks. So that was a great question. And I would say Rick Tyler uh, with uh, their think 20 year per square mile and 10. I think all of us as foresters know you really have to look at what's your local situation. What are your soils? What are your tree species? Uh, how's your local climate there? It makes a big difference. So you always have to adapt. And if that's what works for good for you guys, I would stay stick with it. Do, 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 do. One question is in definition of hunting in Connecticut. Ah, uh, boy, that we have what twelve different zones here, and it really depends on zones. A couple of the zones, basically, are, there's no limit, and some of the zones I don't deer hunt, so I don't know the rules. Um, some of the zones, you can't choose me. By killing deer, do you reduce the effectiveness of coyotes? Are you losing some natural control? Don't know. It might be more of a, a question, are we having impact? Our bear herds really been growing in the northern part of the state now. Bears may be taking down as many fawns as they were from some reports out of the Pittsburgh area where I think they were taking, what, was it a third to half of fawns every year were actually uh, predated by bears? In central New York, does it matter in playing for a clear cut of the prior stand canopy of softwood plantation? Pete. I would ask you to answer that because I don't know central New York and that's your area. So I'd say, yes, it does. Harmon. Hi. Uh, the, you're going to get probably a different, I mean, the, the key thing is that you're going to do a preparatory cut before you do a final overstory removal. And that preparatory cut is going to provide enough sunlight to get desired seedlings established on the ground. Um, but in the process of getting them established, as Jeff was pointing out, there needs to be some kind of protection. So you can't, if you go from a, from a closed canopy to nothing in the canopy, then you're probably not going to be satisfied with the result. I see Paul Ivey has a little bit of a sarcastic comment. <laughs> as a forester and natural resource ecologist, I think deer hunting is a good thing, but that's pretty darn political. Their problem is just getting the hunting population. Well, it's actually stabilized here in Connecticut recently, but it it would be nice to see more. 
that is a good point. You do need to make sure you're also hunting uh, does and uh, fawns. Or you could do what they're doing out in Staten Island where they've given vasectomies to over 800 bucks. That seems pretty cost effective. <laughs> Can you suggest initial? Well, if you have areas, see, the thing is, in areas open to hunting, we rarely see, I can't even think of any areas that have been open to hunting for over 10 years. They have an invasive, uh, I shouldn't say more than 10, they have historically been open to uh, hunting. They have an invasive problem. The one species where I have seen move in is Japanese stilt grass. But generally speaking, if an area is hunted, it doesn't have an invasive control. So there is actually, uh, Rick Tommer made another thing, found around dead trees uh, will protect seedlings. Um, but once they get a little bit bigger than seedlings, um, we found that they'll hit them. Uh, we actually, in one of the clear cuts, and if Alex is still listening, is actually over in North Madison. Uh, they left the, we told them to leave all the tops intact uh, for the slash. And what we found there, that was an area with a lot of deer. That was the area where the bittersweet and honeysuckle and the grapevines really took off climbed over top of all the slash and then pulled down all the regeneration. Okay, two deer lower numbers. Well, good thing Ontario doesn't have that yet, but wait till more things warm up a little bit. <laughs> oh, Dave Marquis in PA, was that the guy who, oh, that was for the exposure study with Susan Sout. Right, he was Susan's uh, predecessor. Right. Let's see, quality deer management state. Deer eat six pounds of food a day. Yeah, I, I heard five. But there, good point about the gypsy moth. There's a. When did your area get affected by the gypsy moth? Uh, let's see. That was 2015 through 2018 is when we really got hammered. No, oh, I see Daniel already answered that. See what kind of birch are we talking about here? Uh, we're talking primarily black birch, although on some of the the higher quality sites, and for us, a quality site is site index 70. You'll start getting in yellow birch. Thing about gypsy moth is we hadn't seen gypsy moth in 30 years, and we didn't think it was a problem anymore. So it comes back. It's a pretty darn scary thing. And Western PA and Western New York. Oh, okay, I was thinking as Eastern New York, they're going to end up getting again. Deer poops. Population size and deer browse intensities versus sharpshooting by professionals. Well, I know sharpshooting, uh, they can take pretty much of them out. I don't know if, oh yeah, actually, uh, Desiree Yantes asked about deer population size. Oh, and browse intensity, no. But there are things about deer population size from recreational hunting and sharpshooting. Uh, look up. Tony D, uh, oh come on, Tony De La Cola and Scott Williams did a paper. There's been some other papers on that. Let's see. Do do. We're imagining not for harvest, but actually like carbon captures. What species mix would you be wanting? Honestly, don't know. And we're going to be working with uh, Tony D'Amato up in uh, Vermont. He's got a. Uh, PhD student who's actually going to be looking at where we have a cutting method study and looking at uh, it's 40 years old now I'm going to be looking at that so I don't know can one control invasives by very aggressive deer hunting the problem that's a great question and one of the problems is is once these invasives are in place they freaking live forever they're very uh, the technical word is recalcitrant they have a very long life so you can aggressively hunt but unless you get rid of, uh, well, you will control still grass because you can let things come back in. But you won't control Japanese barberry. You won't control multiflora rose. You won't control honeysuckle. I suspect, and somebody in New Hampshire can chime in, you're not going to control buckthorn. I think that's going to hang in forever, even if you get rid of all the deer. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, wire exclosures. 
along roads we haven't done any along roadside significant issue with regular hunt. Okay, one thing if somebody has Japanese stillgrass, I want to say from down south, the, uh, Mike uh, Reichenbach, I think so I pronounce his name, said they had stillgrass. They also said uh, we'll follow invasive control with a controlled burn. If you have stillgrass from down south, uh, prescribed fire will actually make Japanese stillgrass explode. Yeah, sharpshooting works. It's just not as uh, as popular. Okay, yeah, Karen Bennett just said uh, you can't control hunting just by hunting. So I want to thank everyone. I'm going to give my vocal cords a little bit of a rest, and I hope everyone has a good afternoon, and hope sooner or later we get some snow out there. So let me do this. <laughs> there's snow and we're gonna people, get we're gonna get snow in new york in the next couple of days so i gotta tell you for anyone who's still listening people don't like snow for me snow like this is like an ansel adams photograph <laughs> that's because you can see all the way through your woods uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh take care oh. everyone thank you jeff for a great presentation and thanks for everybody jeff we were at 275 participants so that's oh, uh that's a great way for you to spend your lunch hour. And I will talk to you at, at about seven six forty-five. Six yes. So the the evening crowd shows up at the last minute. So you can you can I'll I'll be there by six forty-five for sure. So whenever you're ready. Okay, sounds good. Take care. All right. Thank you all. Have a great afternoon. Bye now. Bye.